Alaskans, wherever you are, welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right in a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to MustReadAlaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Welcome, everybody, to the Must Read Alaska show. I'm your host, John Quick, coming to you live from somewhere in Alaska. I hope everybody's having a fabulous summer this summer. We had all, but we had maybe two or three summer days. Maybe that's all we need. The fireweed's kind of coming in where I live. And uh, I'm still hopeful that, you know, one week, we'll get one or two weeks out of summer still, but we'll we'll have to wait and see. Um, I want to thank everybody that listens, watches, and reads Must Read Alaska. We do this for you guys to spread conservative news through all the nooks and crannies of Alaska. If you want to help keep the lights on here at Must Read Alaska, just go to mustreadalaska.com. On the right-hand side, there's a little donate button. Feel free to click on that. Every $5, $10, even $100 helps. If you already do that, we want to thank you for helping keep the lights on here at Must Read Alaska. But without further ado, I have a special guest today. He's been on the show a number of times now. He's come on maybe every couple months, and we're excited to have him back on. Scott Kendall has been the uh, chief of staff for former Governor Walker. He was uh, counsel to Senator Lisa Murkowski's very historic write-in campaign. I think there was only two U.S. senators in the history of the Senate that have successfully won uh, in a write-in campaign. He served as the uh, campaign coordinator for uh, Senator Lisa Murkowski's successful 2016 re-election. He's done a number of ballot measures here in Alaska. Without further ado, welcome Scott Kendall to the Must Read Alaska show. Hey, John, thanks for having me. Well, excited you're back on. It's always fun to chat with you. Um, one of the things I saw recently, I think it was maybe a couple of weeks ago, you had a op-ed in the uh, Anchorage Daily News about renewable energy. It's kind of a buzzword these days. Uh, um, talk to me a little, little bit about that article for folks that maybe didn't have a chance to read it. Um, you had some some fascinating concepts in there. Um, give folks the 101 of kind of what that article was all about. Yeah, I mean, that particular article was pretty narrow. Um, it was about what's called community solar. And I think it's probably something people think they could do right now, but they can't. Um, you know, we have community playgrounds, community gardens. The idea of community solar is, you know, folks in a neighborhood could sort of combine their resources, um, you know, plant a little bit of solar and sort of share the energy and savings that comes from that. And the idea is, you know, installing solar on your own house may not work because of the way your house is oriented or just the barrier to entry of the cost. You know, not everyone can make an investment that doesn't really pay off for 10 years, but yeah. a lot of people could ship in a little. And so it's really just to allow, tells the legislature to allow people to do that, to sort of pool their resources, the kind of things neighbors do, you know, like, I got a neighbor, you know, once in a while, you know, we share a snowblower, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, you got a buddy who's got a boat, you ride on the boat, you pay for gas. It's kind of the Alaska way in my mind, you know, why not? Um, it's sort of a free market principle. And, you know, for those who are like, oh, you know what? Renewable energy is too woke for me. Like my mm -hmm. mind, it's like every bit of energy we produce domestically means that's more for the market. So if if a lot of Anchorage is, is getting their energy from from wind, from solar, well, that means we'll have a surplus of gas to sell or we'll have more gas for the future. So I just, I like the diversification element. I like the free market principle behind it. Well, it's funny. It's like, I I think I hear a lot of folks either say, you know, renewable energy is the devil or oil is the devil. And I think there's some kind of balance in the middle where, you know, obviously you're going to need uh, gas to put in your car to get places. But wouldn't it be cool if we thought of um, different ways to produce energy in Alaska? And I think that's the conversation that this article made people think about, especially in their neighborhoods. So do you think, yeah, is, do you, is this something that House and Senate, they, is there some statute that forbids folks from doing this? Or what's the, what are the, what are the blockades? Um, I mean, the, the blockades are, we have net metering right now. So if I put solar panels up on my house, I can not only save in my bill, but I can actually push energy into the grid. 
the problem we've got is that can only under current law be done on sort of a house by, household by household basis. And this is sort of just lets people, you know, you've, if you've got a little, you know, say you've got a, you live in a subdivision and there's one acre that's undeveloped. It's a little bit of like scrubby, you know, land. It's got some, I don't know, it's got some cottonwoods on it. You don't want the cottonwoods anyway, right? So you could put a solar array there. Everyone could share in the energy, share in the savings. It's actually, when I've talked to people, it's a relatively simple concept. And they're like, I can't do that right now. And the truth is you can't, but you should be able to. Yeah. And there's places, you know, where I live here on the Kenai Peninsula, Halba Cove or Seldovia, where um, Halba Cove, especially, I think they, they literally live off of a diesel generator, the whole community. Right. And so I'm sure sure something like this could open the door up for five or six neighbors to get together and put up some solar where they may not otherwise be able to do so because there is a pretty significant startup cost for solar um i don't know much about it i'm the least of an expert but i went rv we my family and i go rving every summer and you know just for the little rv setup was 1700 bucks you know and that was yeah. something very very small <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, and and I think as we know, or I guess most of us know, you know, petroleum is not going away in the near future or hydrocarbons aren't, you know, whether it's gas, whether it's oil, whether it's diesel. Um, but it, by the same token, sustainable energy hasn't matured to the point where it can be it can be all of your feedstock because it comes and goes with the sun. Battery technology is still trying to catch up. But if it displaces some of that need for diesel, you know, why the heck not? If it if it pencils out and we're finally getting to the point where technology wise, it's starting to pencil out, you know, just like Alaska has an abundance of oil, abundance of gas, it's got an abundance of renewables, whether hydro, you know, solar, like most places in the world have. Um, but, you know, also setting us up for the future, we've got more critical minerals and rare earth minerals than anywhere else in the United States as renewable energy catches on more and more, you know, once again, Alaska is going to be a winner. So to me, it's sort of, you know, good news, good news. Yeah, I had, um, I think a week or so ago, Senator Murkowski was at the, I'm probably going to really botch this name, but granite mine of some sort. And, oh, graphite one. Yeah. yeah, graphite one. And, and, you know, it's, she made a pretty bold stance to say that, not only should the U.S. be producing minerals, but Alaska should be leading the charge. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I mean, I couldn't agree more. It's, you know, right now we're moving towards a transition and it's a transition that will likely last decades. But at the same time, um, you know, when some of our, I guess I wouldn't say, it, you know, enemies, but I would say our economic adversaries like China and others control 90 percent of the minerals we need to transition. That's a that's not only an economic problem, that's a national security problem. The good news is Alaska's got those resources in spades. Um, graphite one, for example, I think it might be the largest known graphite deposit on Earth. And graphite's hugely important to renewables. So it's like it's just sitting there. And it's great to see. I think um the Department of Defense actually gave graphite one a, you know, a grant, right? Some, recently or something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, 30 some million dollar grant because they know, you know, national security, um, National security wise, you know, who controls energy controls the world. Um, you know, we're a net exporter of, of LNG. As we transition to um, renewables, we've got to become a net exporter of these critical minerals. Otherwise, you know, others control our fate. And I don't think any, you know, red blooded American slash Alaskan wants that. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know if the videos I've seen are true or not, but we can assume that regulations in some of these other countries are probably not up to par as it you know as it compares to alaska alaska is kind of in my opinion the golden standard of making sure we do this in a way that's um safe and effective but still produces money yeah i, I think that's exactly right is you know not only um on some level you have to care about the human rights abuses if you have people locked in places working 18 hours a day that's not the way we would treat our citizens yeah. but the other is i think there's an increasing awareness that pollution and carbon emissions they're not local they're global so you know for example the united states used to be the largest carbon emitter on earth our our carbon emissions have plummeted by 25 percent 
but China's increased emissions have overtaken those reductions fourfold. Yeah. So, you know, it, it really is important that if we're playing by the rules, if we're doing things the right way, let's do the most of that manufacturing and that resource production here at home. So um, recently, I don't know, maybe a month ago, we had some heavy hitters come to town for an energy conference um, from the celebrity spectrum to the you know, former chief of staff for the Obama, then mayor of Chicago, you know, some pretty heavy hitters come into the energy conference. Did you have a chance to go? If you didn't, what, what were your thoughts on it that, you know, that you kind of heard through the grapevine? Yeah, I didn't get to go. I did watch some of it online. I did get to talk to a lot of folks who participated and you know, you're not going to love every idea, you know, some, you know, some stuff's a little bit more out there, but I think, um, you know, I've, I've been a, I've been a critic of the Dunleavy administration from time to time. Um, but I will say, you know, his emphasis on carbon sequestration, um, some of these bills are, you know, they're not going to solve our deficit, but they really are forward thinking. Like the, the globe is moving this direction and if the globe's moving that direction, why shouldn't Alaska be in a position to pounce on the opportunity? So a lot of what I saw there was really, um, I think, deserved more attention than it got. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely unique for a Republican governor to offer um, renewable energy solutions as aggressively as he did. And I think um, to his point, I had him on the show a couple months ago and and, you know, our force are just sitting there. His point was, listen, our forests are just sitting there. And if somebody wants to pay us money to, uh, you know, to have them sit there in a more manageable way, because they're going to have to manage the forests, you know, instead of us spending a hundred million bucks on trying to fight the fires, these people now have to mitigate some of those things at their own costs. It just seems like something we should look into. And I, I tend to agree with him. Yeah, I, I actually I was lucky enough to go to a lunch with um, DNR Commissioner Boyle yesterday um, at Commonwealth North, and he was presenting on this. And what was exciting about it was, you know, when you when you engage um, in these practices, for example, you might take some forest land, put it aside for carbon uh, sequestration. But the interesting thing is then you get into active management of the forest. If you've got a bunch of dead black spruce because of spruce beetles, you go in, you harvest those out. You replant something that, you know, like alder or something that works better and could ultimately be sustainably um, harvested for timber. Like it's just like it's a it's it's a win win in a way I don't think the public realizes. It's not as simple as just pointing at some trees and saying those are going to stay there. It's actually you sustainably manage forests in a way that will prevent wildfires, will increase carbon uptake, which is great if you care about the carbon. And also, we've got a better, more robust, healthier forest. So it's it's really good stuff. Yeah, the management of the, I mean, the fires in Alaska are just out of control and not controllable. I mean, it's what are you right. going to do with the size of <laughs> the size of the, you know, Vermont is burning and upper in the upper peninsulas in Alaska. I mean, it's just you can't do much when these fires are just ginormous. And so this gives an opportunity to possibly make some of that more manageable just as a benefit. And so, yeah, yeah, really interesting statistic is, you know, I think the state of Alaska gets a couple of million dollars revenue off of timber sales. We spend a hundred million a year or we have spent a hundred million a year recently fighting forest fires like yeah. our forests aren't working for us the way they could. And I mean, I guess that's the one good thing we could say about this year's summer is, you know, yeah, lots of rain <laughs> and gray, no forest fires. So if I compare this summer to 2019, when it was 90 degrees with forest fires, I've got to take this summer. but. I, I agree with you. I wouldn't ma mind one of these sunny days landing on a Saturday or a Sunday for yeah. once. So you've um, you've had the unique opportunity to um, be around Senator Lisa Murkowski. And like I said, you were a part of the historical write-in campaign. I think, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but I believe only two senators have ever done that. Is that a accurate stat or is that a made up it stat? is and yeah. it's actually even more than that the only other senator who did it was strom thurmond and back in the day he ran as a democrat and he actually ran against a democrat who was dead and a republican because it was too late to pull the dead democrat off the ballot so senator murkowski is actually the first one who did it against two opponents so <laughs> sort of did right he, but did also he lose, like, did he lose to the dead guy and then he had to do a write-in no, he, he, yeah, he lost the primary. Um, the man 
passed away okay. and he ran the right in and, and he won it. So, I mean, good, good for Strom, I guess, you know, <laughs> may he rest in peace, so to speak. You know? But um, Senator Murkowski did it against kind of two major candidate parties, which I think is all the more impressive, not just for her. I mean, yeah, she worked hard, but like, you know, sort of whether she was your number one choice or not, how cool for Alaska that 112,000 of us can get together and, you know, her name's not Jane Smith. It's Lisa Murkowski. And, <laughs> and they wrote that out. So good good for yeah. us, I guess I would say. So um, my point was kind of that you, you're you in a unique position to where you've probably been around her way more than the average person that's going to ever listen to this podcast. So give us a story about Senator Murkowski that maybe not a lot of people have heard. Um, I mean, I think it's more than a story. It's sort of an attribute because um, I think people... And whether this is right or wrong, I've, I've been around um, a number of folks in D.C. I've had the privilege of meeting a lot of senators. Um, you know, I've I've spent time certainly with our Codell. Um, they tend it's it's true what they say. People tend to become creatures of D.C., right? You just you start to care about that stuff. You start to think that way. And, you know, for whatever reason, Senator Murkowski could not be more the opposite. I've, I've traveled with her. You go through an airport. She knows 19 out of 20, not only does she know 19 out of 20 people she walks past, she will stop someone from, you know, uh, Hooper Bay and she'll say, well, how's your daughter doing? Is she a sophomore now? Is she a junior? She just like the people connection is is everything to her and the political stuff doesn't interest her at all. I mean, I was in the Alaska Air Lounge once and I hear I'm I'm traveling with my son and I hear someone yell Henry and that's my son's name. And I sort of like, oh, that's a familiar voice. And I go over and I'm like, oh, I haven't seen the senator in months. We should catch up on political stuff. Now she wants to talk to my son for 20 minutes about <laughs> soccer and school. And she just could not be more interested in people individually. And and I don't know how she keeps that, um, but I think it's remarkable. And I think we're, we're really lucky to have her because she sees you at an airport. She doesn't think, oh, that's a Democrat. That's a Republican. That's a nonpartisan. Or that's a mayor. Or that's just a high school kid. Everyone gets the same treatment. And I don't know if I've ever seen someone who relates to people like that from a position of, you know, being one of, in a real sense, one of the, one of uh, several dozen most powerful people in the country. She really just relates on that one-on-one -on -one level. Yeah. Arguably one of the most powerful women in the country. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I would say that I, I had a similar um, instance with Senator Murkowski. I visited the White House during the Kavanaugh hearings. And so I, it just happened to be that time. And I was stopped into all of our elected officials offices to say hi. Well, I stopped into Senator Murkowski's and as you can imagine, her office was just, it was nuts. I mean, right. phones are ringing off the hook. Literally there's like a line to even get into her office. I mean, it was just nuts. And so I'm like, oh, there's no way I'm going to be able to, you know, I'll just pop in and and, uh, you know, at least just tell the staff up front uh, that I was here and, and you know, would have been nice to meet with her. But I understand because she has literally 17 <laughs> people in line waiting to meet with her and people picketing outside of her office. And, and so I go in and I say, hey, I'm John from Alaska and, and just wanted to say hi to the senator. And as soon as they heard I was from Alaska, they basically, you know, stopped everything and senator murkowski met with met with me for probably 45 minutes oh wow yeah and, i mean that's that's the thing she will treat alaskans different um and you know she's someone who could for example she could go on the sunday talk shows every week if she wants she almost never does um but she talks to the press here it's 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 sort of remarkable now that we're i guess 21 years in um, to her tenure in the U.S. Senate that she's she's kept that, you know, and again, like, you know, she hears you're in Alaska and her ears perk up and she comes out and spends time with you. So that's a that's a great story. And I'm I'm zero percent surprised by it. Yeah, I it was the first time I ever met. I mean, I was I, I was very I knew who nobody was. And so a guy named Fish pulled me back into his office, which I had, I had no idea who he even was. And he made sure I was actually from Alaska and, you know, it wasn't some <laughs> kind of covert, covert, uh, you know, um, thing to do because Kavanaugh was just so chaotic, I guess, for them. And so 
he yeah, kind of yeah, sniffed was me heated. out and figured out I was the real a real person from Alaska. And man, it, we had a great conversation. Me and the the person I was with, I was with the uh, a chief of uh, the fire department here in Nikiski, uh, and we just had a great conversation with the senator. And I always remember that she took time out of her schedule and made us feel like a million bucks. That's great. So let's switch gears here a little bit. Um, we have a congressional race, you know, that's going to be here before we know it, kind of already here, right? Um, right. What are your thoughts on, is can, is there anybody out there that can beat Congresswoman Mary Patola? Because I know, so I know staunch conservatives, I, I don't know, you know, put that in quotes, right. out here that live in the woods in the middle of nowhere that voted for Mary Patola. And now, right. and I, and I know everybody in between that, you know, they voted for and all this kind of stuff. And she's been able to, uh, you know, there's not a lot of people that I know that have met her that have a bad word to say about her. She's got a smile. People like her. That alone is a huge, it's going to be very hard to beat. So what's your take? Do you think she, is there anybody out there that's could even remotely come close to beating Mary Patola? Well, I, I, you know, I think there's always, it's like, it's like uh, boxing, right? I, I used to box. So, you know, they always said, um, you know, fighters make matchups. There's always someone who can beat anyone. Um, but, you know, there's also, you can get given the gift of a weak opponent and run away with it. I, I agree with what you say about um, Representative Peltola. Um, very positive, very charismatic in person in many of the same ways that former Governor Palin is. Um, I don't know if you spent time with former Governor Palin, um, but the handful of times I have, um, you know, whatever some folks think of her politics or other things, total charisma um, totally makes you feel like you're the only person in the room, extremely positive, extremely high on Alaska. And I think Mary's got the same thing. She loves her state and that authenticity comes through. And, you know, and she does have some things. She's got some arrows in her quiver. I think Willow was a massive, massive win. Um, I think we're only kind of going to kind of realize in the coming years how big a win that was. And I don't know if that happens without her in place. I know it doesn't happen if we don't have her and Lisa there. I think the Biden administration rolls over us yet again. But I think the two of them in some combination made that happen. And that's that's pretty darn meaningful to get that out of a Democratic administration. So she's got the proof points. And, you know, and, you know, and I also think, um, you know, history is a great teacher. Um, and I will say, you know, Nick Begich ran against her twice and lost twice and lost by more the second time. There was sort of an issue where, you know, he lost the first time and people said, oh, but if he'd been matched up against Mary Direct head to head, he would have won. But by the time we got to November and, I, and you can look at the vote file, he actually would have lost by more than Palin lost. So I sort of wonder, like, what's different? Um, if, if I guess if I'm the Peltola team, I'm thinking, great, you know, a known quantity, we beat him twice, we'll beat him again, as opposed to someone that could sort of hit Mary where she's strong, you know, someone with strong rural support, someone with special expertise and resource development, um, someone who is socially moderate, you know, you could kind of make those inroads. I don't see it. That, and this is, you know, my opinion's worth what you just paid me for it, which is nothing. <laughs> um, but but I, I don't see it. I don't I don't see any lightning in a bottle for Mr. Begich. Well, I think that, you know, I, I, I'm a fan of Nick. I voted for Nick, but I also want Alaska to be successful. And I'm different in that when the person I didn't vote for wins, I still want them to be successful because if they're successful, Alaska is successful. Absolutely. And, um, I think that. Congresswoman Patola has, in the day and age of uh, Republicans, you know, going after Democrats and Democrats going after Republicans in a way that's like, who draws blood first? I think a lot of people see Congresswoman Patola as like, oh, gosh, finally somebody who's not just going for people's jugulars. Right. Yeah. And, and I think putting party aside, it is good, I think. Um, whether she's your first choice or not, it is good to have someone where they are, maybe she follows her party more than you'd like, but she doesn't always. And it's good, I think, to have someone in office that when your state's interests in some way conflict with whoever your party is, that they will they will make that choice to go, you know, Alaska first, Alaska over party. I think that's an important 
bit of integrity to have. Yeah, we saw that recently with her couple amendment votes to keeping gas stoves kind of off the political. <laughs> table. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a that's an interesting one to me too. I don't quite get it, but you know, here we are. I'm I'm glad she voted the way she voted. I I will say that. Yeah. So um, let's chat ballot initiatives real quick. Um, I get a lot of um, folks curious, how do they even come about? And so can, I know you've been involved in a number of them. Um, can you give us the kind of ballot initiative 101? Why do we have them? What's their purpose? How does somebody even get one on the ballot to begin with? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 more a phenomenon of Western states, as I think most people know, but maybe maybe you don't. As as Western states, which are comparatively younger than East Coast states, came on, it's something many of these states built into their constitutions on this idea of you know populism and direct democracy are important, and I think that manifests in two ways, and we've seen both ways in Alaska. We've seen okay, there are issues that are immensely important and popular to the public, but for whatever reasons, legislators won't touch it. And I would, in, in that vein, I would say campaign finance. You can go across the spectrum, well over 70% of Democrats, well over 70% of Republicans, everyone in the middle want campaign finance limits. And the only reason we have them at all in Alaska is they passed a ballot measure in the 80s. Um, and then, you know, we've seen uh, legislative efforts to raise those limits. And, and then, of course, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals wiped out our limits. And you'd think, being Alaskans, we'd be like, you know, to heck with you, Ninth Circuit. We're going to put them back. You know, we have to put them at a higher level. We understand that. And yet we can't get it done. And so that's the kind of issue. I think other category of issues to me are maybe issues that don't really have any opposition, but that the legislature, for whatever reason, doesn't make a priority. And I would say the tribal recognition issue is a great a recent example of that. I worked with the team. We put a ballot measure together. We qualified it for the ballot. And then we didn't have to vote on it because all of a sudden the legislature said, oh, people give a darn about this. And it passed, you know, nearly unanimously. Um, we had Senator Shower, who was one of the champions in the Senate. Um, I was at the the bill signing, which was just a pure celebration. You know, you've got Representative Tiffany Zolkowski speaking, then you've got Senator Mike Shower speaking, and then you have Governor Dunleavy signing the bill. And so I think it can be a useful tool to sometimes bring people together around something that like, you know, gosh darn it, like this is common sense. We need to we need to make this a priority. Maybe, maybe this issue doesn't have a set of lobbyists, but it's important. And it's got to take a lot of work, I, I imagine. It's not like you and a couple friends get together and I think it'd be <laughs> cool to do a ballot initiative. I mean, this takes a gargantuous amount of work, right? Yeah, it, it, it takes, you know, you have to have some sort of, um, you know, the barriers aren't huge. You know, the, the Department of Law is fairly forgiving, but you have to have some ability to draft statute. Um, and then, of course, you have to have, a, you know, at least 100 friends to even apply. And then after that, go out and get thirty to 40,000 signatures. So it really is you know, there are barriers in place, and I think appropriately so. You know, not every goofball idea that 100 people have should make it onto the ballot. But <laughs> but if you can get 40,000 Alaskans to say, hey, we at least want to be heard on this, I think that's important. So one of the, we're, we're almost out of time, but I want to uh, get this last question in. Um, one of the uh, current initiatives, I don't know if that's the right word for it, but is kind of repealing ranked choice voting. You were on the yes on ranked choice voting team. Um, there's a group of folks out there that have gathered signatures. I've heard they've gathered 150,000 that may or may not be an accurate number. Um, do you think that these folks have a chance of essentially repealing ranked choice voting? What's your take on it? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the first thing to note is, you know, they're going after the whole system. So they're going after the open primary and the ranked choice voting. So um, the the ranked choice voting, I know there's a perception it caused delays. That was a division of elections decision to hold back the tabulation. We could discuss that at a later date. But the open primary part is universally very popular. So um, it's going to be a big question. Um, you know, when people who um, decided to do something, albeit a bit narrowly, um, have that, you know, that opportunity to take that away, are they going to realize that 
okay, right now you've got a ballot in your hand in the primary that's got every candidate on it, and we're taking that back away from you, I think it's going to be a heated debate. Now, in the meantime, do I believe they have 150,000 signatures? No way, no how. They, they don't have 100,000. They don't have 70,000. Um, no one's ever done that. These guys aren't going to do it. And, you know, they have a very, you know, to date, and I won't go into depth because they deserve their due process, but they have a very troubling record at this point, given um, the financial shenanigans we've seen, which, you know, you should have them on the show. They should, they should have an opportunity to explain themselves. But if you can explain to me why you form a church in Seattle, Washington, called the Ranked Choice Education Association, and then run all of your donations through a, a church, quote unquote, that's about ranked choice, you know, someone's got to answer those questions, I think, because the public cares about honesty. You can disagree, you know, you can disagree heatedly. I mean, I know you're probably not a fan of ballot measure two, but you and I will have a great discussion and we'll have good faith arguments. But when you lie, cheat, steal, that's that that's not okay. So like I said, they're entitled to due process. They're entitled to their day in court. They're entitled to go on shows like yours and explain themselves. But the record we got so far, to me, it's disturbing, and I can't explain it. I can't explain it except for bad motivations. So the timeline, let's say they get the whatever signatures that they need to get, 40,000 of the 150,000 are good. They're distributed through all the you know, different places correctly. Is, it, is the timeline going to be, it'll be on next year's ballot? Or is it going to be on this year's? I've, a lot of people are are wondering that. They they just you know people are curious. You know what does that look like? Or is that not a question for you? Because it's it's um, too hard to say if how this is going to pan out. Well, it depends. Um, the answer is they. I think they have till sometime in February to gather their signatures because you put a petition in, you've got a year. But if they don't put those signatures in before the start of the legislative session then it won't be on the ballot in the fall. So if they get signatures in and those signature enough of those signatures are valid and they get them in before the start of the mid-January legislative session, then it's on the ballot in the fall. So it could be this this fall or it could be ne the next one, 2025. Who knows? Yeah, it would be 2026 because 2026, it, has to be a, okay. yeah, it has to be a statewide election. They, they don't call a special election. It just, it piggybacks onto the next ballot. Got it. So, um, well, we're 35 minutes in, and I want to be respectful of your time. Any last-minute thoughts here before we head out? No, not at all. Um, just uh, let, let's do it again. Um, let's let's pray for a couple more sunny days and some fish in our freezers. And, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, as always, John, I appreciate the conversation. It's a fun, respectful conversation, and uh, look forward to talking soon. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it, Scott. Thanks for coming on the show, and welcome back anytime. Thanks, everybody, for uh, listening, watching, and reading Must Read Alaska. Again, if you want to help keep, keep the lights on here at Must Read Alaska, just go to mustreadalaska.com on the right-hand side. There's a little donate button. Every $5, $10, $100 helps. And uh, until next time, I'm John Quick from somewhere in Alaska. Thanks, Scott. Thank you.